Coming up on Tech News Today, Essential gets serious money from Amazon and Tencent, but maybe not a serious release date. Intel is rolling out a fleet of autonomous vehicles for testing its technology. Facebook decloaks the cloakers. Anchor shows off the budget Echo Dot and updated advice on picking a good password. All that and more up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1828, recorded Wednesday, August 9th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by Eero. Never think about Wi-Fi again with Eero's hyper-fast, super simple Wi-Fi system. And now, the second generation Eero is tri-band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping, visit Eero.com, select overnight shipping at checkout, and enter code TNT. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk about some of the biggest tech news stories with people who are passionate about technology. I'm Jason Howell. Megan Maroney is out today. She'll be back tomorrow. But in her place, we have the return of Jonathan Strickland. How's it going, Jonathan Strickland? Great. I've been plotting my return for ages, and now I am ready to pounce upon you and uh, take over the entire show. And now I'm afraid, although when we connected and you were going like this and occasionally you, you had the little Dr. Evil thing going, um, I didn't think twice about it. But now I am actually afraid. Yes, it's, it's the fact that you can't see just off screen the spy that I have dangling <laughs> over the pit of piranhas <laughs> Just, luckily the glass is soundproof so oh okay good well whatever whatever it takes to get through an entire show if it if it's a spy on the other side of the glass dangerously over a pit of piranhas then hey i'm happy to have you regardless um so you you actually just launched a new show tell us a little bit about that yeah, so we've started a live stream show right now. Uh, there's the possibility that we're going to have this expand into a podcast and who knows what else in the future. But right now, we're using uh, the Facebook platform as our live streaming platform for um, on How Stuff Works' Facebook page. The show is called Game Changers, and it's all about games and gaming. So every aspect of gaming you can imagine, we are tackling in this show. So our very first episode was about Monopoly because I think of it as sort of the granddaddy of all modern board games. Uh, we just did one today about Dungeons and Dragons. That one went over great. Uh, last week we did one about cricket where we had a bunch of Americans try to explain cricket. So <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> no, you definitely never know what you're going to get when you ask Americans to explain cricket. I don't even know. Like, if you were to have asked me that on that episode, I would have no answer for you. I'd, I'd be just a bunch of ums and uhs. It's just similar enough to baseball to be incredibly confusing. All right. So then Game Changers is, is not specifically about, like, tabletop gaming. It's just about games. Period. Yes, and it could be about video games, about we did one on Mario, but we'll do ones about specific video games. It could be about uh, game theory. I mean, it's not just related to a specific title. So awesome. it's all about this this passion that a lot of us have for this hobby and uh, everything from the solo games about ways for you to just kind of plunge into a game by yourself to the more social games that are experiencing a real renaissance right now. We're seeing an explosion in board and card games that are bringing people together. And I want to tap into that. And that's yeah. that's my Monopoly episode. Now, that was a good episode. Okay, but that's not two boards next to each other. I thought you were doing the, the version of Monopoly where you buy two boards and put them up together and it's like mega Monopoly. But no, that's Monop just the box. Monopoly just in one board is more than enough. <laughs> yes. No one... 
No one should ever put two boards together, ever. <laughs> it happens, though. It happens. In the world of tabletop gaming, people get pretty darn creative, uh, whether they need to or not. Well, your expertise in that area is going to come up gonna be very handy a little bit later in the show. Right now, let's talk about a few top stories. If you've been wondering where the heck that essential smartphone that was announced by Andy Rubin a few months ago is, well, continue to wonder. But the company just announced that Amazon's Alexa Fund and Tencent have invested a cool $300 million into the company. As can be expected, the phone will be sold on Amazon when it finally gets its release someday, uh, also at Best Buy. And it was unveiled on May 30th, you may remember. Uh, Andy Rubin had noted, uh, I think, later in the day that it should hit the market within 30 days that never happened. We're now very far from those 30 days. Um, but once again, they did what they've done a few times now. Even Andy, a couple of weeks ago, said, we're going to have an announcement in a week. That never happened. But today, uh, the president, Niccolo De Masi, says, I will give you an exact date in a week. They are really good at telling us that, that it's just going to be another week before they tell us more stuff. Yeah, I, it's the wimpy version of I will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger <laughs> yes. today. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> what do you think? And so um, the essential, you know, has a kind of a, a strikingly unique, I would say, design quality, although it's very possible that some of these design touches are going to end up in the new iPhone based on some rumors. Uh, wh what do you think about essential uh, as it stands right now? Uh, I think it's interesting to see yet another entry into the luxury Android market, a market that has had a lot of um, volatility to it, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, you've got Andy Rubin, who he's a, like the expert on Android behind this. So that's something. But the design, while very striking, you know, the fact that we keep seeing these delays, it's not terribly surprising when you realize how many complications come into just the – uh, production and manufacture of a device, you realize that there are all these sorts of issues that you cannot necessarily predict within supply chains that mm -hmm. can cause delays we don't know about. Uh, I, I think it's a very interesting looking device. I do not know if I would plunk down the money for it. Uh, I like the philosophy behind it, the idea that it's a device that doesn't have anything on it that you don't want. You get the freedom to put whatever apps you want on there. You're not going to be saddled with a bunch of stuff on the front end. Assuming that remains true with this Amazon partnership, I start to get a little antsy when I hear that. Could it possibly find its way creeping into the essential? And we start seeing that this promise of a, of a, of a blank space has been replaced by a platform for Amazon to sell you more stuff. Which, I mean, one would have to guess is why Amazon uses their fund to invest in anything, I would imagine. You know what I mean? Like, the yeah. the only other smartphone they've ever had was their smartphone, the Fire Phone. It was a, his, a, a historically, you know, big flop. But mm -hmm. it was a smartphone that aimed to give its users a direct vehicle into which, you know, to, to buy Amazon products and to, you know, in aid in shopping. It had a bunch of other, you know, kind of lame bells and whistles to it. But is does this investment then point to essential being kind of like a, you know, an avenue for Alexa to be installed upon? I don't I don't know. I guess that remains to be seen. Andy Rubin was pretty, pretty gung ho about the idea that uh, the essential would be close to stock, if not stock, you know, a stock experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be kind of a, an interesting turn of events if suddenly it's like, yeah, it's stock, but we also have this new, you know, voice assistant in there and it's got some Amazon pre-installed apps and whatever, but maybe consumers want that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, but it, to me, to me, that's, that's a red flag immediately. If you, especially to a lot of users, I say it's a red flag where if, if you have made one set of promises early on, and it appears that you have gone back on those, whether it's yeah. because you didn't word it properly from the start or things change that you could not predict. A lot of people have very low tolerance for that sort of thing, and they feel like it's a, a betrayal. I see this in tech all the time where someone gets really excited about the project they're working on. They talk it up initially, and then ultimately when the prod product or project launches, uh, it doesn't deliver upon that initial set of promises 
people can turn on you and it it can get uglier than those piranhas are right now. <laughs> the stand down piranhas, stand down, not yet. You can't have that that person yet. Um yeah, and you know if if, if we could turn back time, if we could find a way uh, to to go back and have sorry I'm sorry I got some groans here in the studio if we could go back to when Andy first unveiled the uh, the phone and he didn't say available in the next 30 days it would be a different story would be we'd be talking about now right like it would still be this like well I'm very curious to see it's unfortunate that they started the story like that uh, however if he had done that and they had actually delivered it stood to gain a lot from that initial kind of burst of buzz. And right now, as it goes along longer and longer, it's just kind of losing that. So it's really that the timing has not been good. Now we're like right up on the season of mm -hmm. all of these new phone launches happening. The Note 8, the Pixel devices are a few, you know, probably a month, month and a half out, we would guess. Uh, there's a bunch of things right on the other, right on the corner uh, that, that it's going to have to contend with. Yeah, let me give some free advice to any companies or, or people out there who want to release a big product. Rather than tell us that something is going to come out, say, within 30 days, and you aren't 100% sure you can deliver upon that, keep it as secret as you can. Wait yeah. until the day it is ready, say, and and you'll be able to buy it right now because people lose their minds yeah it's so true if you're if you're able to do something where you reveal it, i mean it's hard to keep a secret these days with everybody looking over every single element of production but if you're able to do that and then keep that announcement to the day when it is ready to hit store shelves you make such an enormous impact you you don't stand that danger of announcing something before it's ready and then facing a setback and then having to deal with that PR nightmare. Yeah. I feel like OnePlus is actually pretty good at that. They, which they tease up a, up and along the way as they get closer to the phone. They let you know that there is something happening, but they don't kind of give you the full story until finally they do. And sometimes, at least in the past, not every time, but sometimes it's available to order. Um, at least put your pre-order pre in so you can jump on that initial kind of buzz. So, right. yes, lots to learn. Uh, and you'd think Andy Rubin would, would already know this stuff, but hey, I'm going to give him a pass. He created Android. I'm a big fan of Android, if you didn't know. So I'm very curious to see <laughs> the phone once it finally comes out. Intel finalized its acquisition of Mobileye not too long ago and now plans to prepare a 100-vehicle fleet of test vehicles. Uh, <laughs> 100 vehicle fleet of test vehicles. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, to ca uh, capable of nearly full autonomy, not complete full autonomy, completely full autonomy, but almost vehicles of all different brands and types will be utilized to show off how the technology can be supplied to all sorts of partners. Not only that, it'll allow Intel to validate the safety of the systems. And uh, so it's level four autonomy, which is nearly all situations can be driven autonomously. Level five is complete autonomy. They're just kind of working to do what a lot of the, you know, the competitors in the space are doing right now. Waymo, GM, Ford, they're all keeping this active test fleet in different areas so that they can learn the, the different geography, you know, the, the diversity of ge geographic locations and really train and uh, hone in on their autonomous technology. What do you think? Uh, I think this is fascinating. I think level four autonomy. I'm so glad that we now have levels that we can actually talk about because it was a very confusing conversation to have with someone. If you were telling them about a driverless car, but it's not really completely driverless. Uh, these right. levels make it much easier because you understand with level four, it means in your standard driving conditions that you can imagine in your just average place that you're not experiencing any extreme temperatures. You're not worried about running into uh, flooding situations or ice or things like that. But under standard operating conditions with standard traffic, the car can manage on its own. It's only when you start getting outside of that standard and the further out you go, the less certain the car is of how to react properly. Mm -hmm. That's where you understand that there is an enormous gap between level four and level five. That That is a fundamental huge gap because there's so many different possible scenarios that can happen on the road. They don't happen frequently, but they are in fact possible that until you can account for all of those, you're not going to have a fully autonomous car, at least not to the true definition of level five. Seeing Intel in this space makes me happy. I like I like seeing lots of uh, 
uh, approaches and competition. I like the fact that they're using lots of different brands of cars in this because that's going to give them a lot of valuable data to help build into their models so that they can start edging closer and closer to level five. The fact that they're going to put them in different geographic areas means they're going to encounter vastly different driving conditions. The conditions here in my town of Atlanta are going to be very different than, say, Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. So running it, running into all of that sort of stuff means that we are gathering the information necessary to actually reach that future where we can have a truly driverless car. I don't know that we're going to get there as fast as people like Elon Musk thinks we will. I mean, he's said that within two years, he thinks that Tesla is going to have a level five autonomous car. That seems incredibly ambitious to me. It doesn't necessarily mean it's outside the realm of possibility, but I find it really aggressive considering the, well, one, considering Tesla's record with driver assist systems, but two, just considering the massive amount of complications you face. Um, that being said, I'm glad Intel's in this. I'm glad we're seeing it with lots of different vehicles. It's kind of funny because it sounds like the way Intel's going. It almost It's almost like an aftermarket autonomous vehicle solution. <laughs> yeah, that, it does kind of sound like that for sure. And it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you think about just the the geographic diversity, as they put it, that's it's a really interesting point uh, that you bring up that I, I kind of forget about. And I think maybe a lot of people kind of don't think about that when they're talking about this future of autonomous vehicles, how challenging it it has got to be when we get to the point to where cars that are driving by themselves are on icy roads for example or mm -hmm. you know or a combination of icy hilly roads and how they effectively navigate that versus what a human would do like there's so many variables in that scenario and as sure. a human passenger you got to have a lot of trust like you we might get to a point where we feel trust in autonomous vehicles in the city because there are i mean there's a lot of easy to to represent um, aspects to that or, or uh, uh, I don't know, a lot of things happen the same way all the time when you're driving in the city, let's say. There's little bits of variables here and there, but you always know that there aren't going to be these very random elements like ice or like heavy rain that makes the road slick because it's, it's now oily with a sheet with a thin sheet of, of water and how the computer mm -hmm. compensates for that as a passenger, we're going to have to have a, a level of trust there. And that makes me think that this is a lot further away than I've been thinking. It probably is. I mean, uh, you also think like there are, this is non-trivial too. A lot, a lot of autonomous car design incorporates human psychology. Uh, it, this is absolutely true in all forms of robotics where the robotics and the humans are interacting. Psychology plays a huge part. It's not just, not for the sake of the robots, but for the sake of the people who are interacting with that technology. How do you design it in such a way that the interaction is a positive one, not a negative one? And uh, it means that you also have to look at regional differences in driving. So, for example, in Boston, I imagine the autonomous cars will have to start honking before a light even changes from red to green. Otherwise, everyone in Boston's not going to know what to do without that immediate, you know, that, that, that sensory overload as yeah. soon as they're supposed to act. Yeah, right, right. Also, also I don't drive in Boston. <laughs> because they're always honking all over the place. Yeah, that's one reason. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, I've never driven there either, so I'll take your word on that. Uh, Facebook says that it's cracking down on cloaking, which is a practice that effectively enables an ad or a post on Facebook to represent itself as one thing to Facebook's review process while servicing or serving up another thing entirely to those who actually click through on it. So a post, for example, that appears to be about flower deliveries in the news feed then becomes an ad for diet pills when just a random person clicks through on it. It's, it's you know, the actual thing when Facebook reviews clicks through. So you can see why this is bad. Uh, and now you guessed it, Facebook is assigning some swift artificial intelligence along with additional human attention to the problem to hopefully improve the experience uh, for its users because AI is the solution to everything these days when it comes to Facebook and all these big companies uh, and how they're policing their networks, their social networks, how they're making it clean and all this kind of stuff, training it, informing it. And this is another way that they're cleaning it up. But I haven't been on Facebook since December, so I don't know how not clean it has been. Are, are you on Facebook these days? 
Uh, I am frequently on Facebook. I have not noticed this particular issue. I have even I'm I'm one someone who occasionally clicks on the ads because sometimes I mean the ones that have been served up to me have been pretty good. Like they've been fairly close to the sort of things that I'm interested in. Probably looking at you know cookies and stuff or figure that out. But mm-hmm. I I'm I'm seeing stuff that is applicable to my life. So there's an example. There's a a a, a gift card company like you know like a the greeting cards that that it, it had a little ad in my Facebook feed and I really liked it and I clicked on it and I bought cards from them and that's awesome so I haven't had this particular situation this kind of strategy always frustrates me because of multiple reasons from a user standpoint you get a bait and switch you might have actually been interested in what was supposedly being the the ad and then mm-hmm. you end up getting something else entirely uh, it devalues web advertising for everybody because the only thing the the people are who are behind this are concerned with is getting page views. They don't care about anything else. They just have to trick you somehow into getting that page view because that page view represents some sort of monetary gain for that person. Now, they might also be trying to get malware on your system, but I think most of them are just spam at this right. point. But – that spam devalues legitimate traffic for everybody else. So the more we see bot activity and spam activity online, the harder it is for the brands that you actually like, the content creators that you like, the harder it is for them to actually do legitimate business because it brings into question how valid are those views that you are you getting? You know, are are you actually getting, you know, views from completely different sources? that are you know autonomous sources that's not great for us so this is a very frustrating problem i'm glad that they're looking into it uh, i have no idea what their artificial intelligence algorithms are doing specifically to find this sort of stuff but i am happy to hear that they are looking into it very curious to know how how the the people who are doing this, the spammers, bad actors, whoever they are, how they're able to target Facebook reviewers in a different way than anyone else clicking on the link. I mean, apparently, it's by targeting their IP addresses. They've yeah, okay. got uh, they've got essentially a laundry list of IP addresses for Facebook review staff, and for those people, they're getting a completely different picture than everyone else is, which is pretty insidious. Yeah, that's uh, that's no good. Facebook says there's there is no legitimate use of this sort of tactic. Uh, it's always tied to a spammer or a bad actor, and as such, will always be removed once it's discovered. So there you go, a cleaner Facebook. Up next, John and I are going to take uh, a, a look at a few new product announcements from the past 24 hours. It turns out there were a couple of things that have been announced. We'll talk about those, but first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage. They are the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience. If you've ever gone through the whole process, you know it's not always keeping up with the times. It's not definitely not digitally current in, in many scenarios. You got to go all over the place to pull this information in order to complete the mortgage process. And it could be a lot easier. It was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple. That allows you to fully understand all the details and be totally confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's also powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or even your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds based on your income, your assets, your credit. Rocket Mortgage takes all that information analyzes all the home loan options for which you qualify, and then finds the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. All right, so some product announcements. If the Echo Dot is still a bit too spendy for your blood, it's not that expensive to begin with, but Anchor is showing off the new Eufy Genie smart speaker armed with Amazon's voice assistant engine that I won't say out loud, though I'll probably mess up later because it's going to fire off your Echo. Uh, priced at only $35, the smallish 
a black flat orb looking device has a few far field mics on board listening for the wake word to get to get started also on board is a two watt speaker that anchor says is quote better sound but fails to provide the comparison point. So we can only assume it's better sound than absolutely no sound. Uh, but maybe they meant it's better than the Echo Dot. We'll never know. Uh, but even if it's not, it has an external speaker port on the backside. If you want to get all creative and hook it up to your own speakers or your own uh, sound system, you can do that. Do you have an Echo? Is this, a, is this appealing, a, an even lower cost Echo? I, I have a Google Home. Okay. Yeah, I, I have. One I of don't those. have an Echo. So, uh, but my parents do. They love their Echo, and um, I. Th there's nothing unappealing about this. I, I heard some people kind of surprised to hear that that uh, Amazon essentially has welcomed developers into creating these kind of products. And I turn to them and I say, you don't really think that the Dot and the Echo are the end game for Amazon, do you? I mean. It's just like we were talking about with the essential smartphone. These are these are av these are definitely avenues for you to use yeah. Amazon services. So for them, it's it's the gateway to sell you stuff to not. And I, this isn't me like judging. I think it's a brilliant business plan, and I have no problem with it whatsoever. But that's why to me it's not surprising. It's what do I want more people coming to my service to buy things? Yes, please. So. Uh, I think it's I think it's something to be expected. I imagine that if we go to CES this next year, we're going to see a ton of devices on the market that have this uh, echo and dot functionality. What was that? What was that word again? She used to. Oh, oh the uh, the Al Al something. <laughs> it had an X and then maybe an uh. I, I kept on very uh, – I was thinking to myself like, all right, wait, Jason's already set the stage. I cannot do it. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It's it easier is. to do with Google Home because it has a very – the, the different – oh, sorry, go. I, I, I watch – there's some YouTube videos that I watch, some, some series that I watch that are – the content creators will – at the beginning of videos, they're just messing around. Yeah. And they often like to mess around with their – Google Home, and mine is literally right next to my television system. <laughs> so I get to – my search history of my Google Home is not entirely mine. Yeah, like there needs to be some way to like if that's happening, some some uh, some rejection uh, setup that you can like tie it to your TV and have it reject anything that comes from your TV or something. I don't know. Maybe that's too complicated. Yeah. But I mean the difference that – I think the main difference is that – the Google Home in in the name itself is not the wake up word in in right. the Amazon case the, you know the, the name of this technology is the wake up word so there's no way to talk about the technology without saying the wake up word which just makes people upset anyways uh apparently this does not have bluetooth for for connecting uh for streaming audio but there will be a $40 model coming soon that will offer bluetooth and Ufi I didn't know this is Anchor's kind of lineup of smart products that they have coming out so they're going to have smart bulbs, a RoboVac, smart plug switches, light strips, kind of like an entry level price point of uh, smart home stuff. So, of course, this will control those. But because it has Amazon's voice assistant, uh, it will also do all of those skills as well. So good, good kind of entry point, I suppose, if mm -hmm. people are wondering about getting their, uh, you know, stepping into the smart home world. Here you go. Yeah, if you don't if you don't want to dump a thousand dollars on all the different components and then kind of hope that they're all. Uh, compatible with one another. I, I really like seeing this. I like, you know, it, I like seeing a range of different products that are on the market. And I specifically like seeing a bunch that, uh, you know, from the get go are going to be compatible with your system. And it's not going yeah. to be one of those situations where you find out, oh, that smart thermostat I bought isn't actually compatible with this particular personal assistant product. And now, the thing I was really looking forward to, I can't actually do unless I spend even more money changing one or the other out. And yep. so I like that it's it's helping deal with some of the confusion that's in the marketplace. It's hitting that budget level, which is great. I like seeing that. And it doesn't take away the fact that there are these other more perhaps premium products that are still out there. 
Yeah, absolutely. If if it all inter interoperates, then it shouldn't. Hopefully, it shouldn't matter. Although you know, I don't know if the Eufy line requires a hub. Like I have the Hue bulbs, they require mm -hmm. a specific hub. It would be really great in a perfect world if my Google Home just was the hub for all of my smart home products. Maybe that's too much to ask, but that would be a great place to get to. Agreed. Acer announced a new Chromebook for those of you who worry about durability. The Acer Chromebook 11C771 can withstand up to 132 pounds of downward force. In other words, it could possibly survive the tree trunk chuck test, uh, though don't quote me on that. It meets military standards for drop, dust, and water resistance, so it's perfect, uh, obviously, for a returning to school student. And under the hood, it has an 11.6-inch IPS display, Intel's 1.6 gigahertz Celeron chip, so kind of an older chip from the laptops. Now it's coming over to Chromebooks. And soon, though, the ability to pick up one of uh, the core i3 or i5 uh, chips. That's beginning in September, so you'll be able to kind of beef it up. There's no pricing on that, but this model is 280 without touchscreen or 330 with touchscreen. Have you done any of the, the Chrome OS stuff? Or are you in that world at all? I don't own a Chrome OS book. I think uh, I think they, it's an interesting operating system. I have looked at them before, but it's not really what meets my needs for stuff typically. Uh, I mean, it would be great for a very lightweight computer I could use with all of my office stuff here at work because we use a lot of the Google services. So right. it would be very easy to tie into that and be extremely lightweight for me to move around. Not this particular one. The rugged one is a little more hefty. <laughs> but um, but I haven't had a whole lot of personal experience with it. I do think that they missed a huge opportunity. They should have partnered with Hasbro because if you have a rugged Chromebook, you should call it the Tonka. Oh, I like that. The Tonka, the Tonka book. <laughs> yeah, if it can withstand all this pressure and all this damage, and it's a Chrome book, you yeah. got to call it Tonka. <laughs> I agree. I, I like, I actually really like the sound of the Tonka book. Uh, I'm going to write that down, Tonka book. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I use, I've used this, this is the first generation Chromebook Pixel. I've used this mm -hmm. since uh, since shortly after it released, I'm obviously still using it. It's pretty dated at this point. I still feel like this sucker is awesome. Like I don't ever feel rarely. I'm like, if I open up a bunch of tabs, maybe I'll experience some slowdown, but this thing keeps up with me. And ever since using this, I'm really happy that I started doing it. I realized that my my hesitancy around Chrome OS was always, well, but I do a lot of things with my computer that aren't just web browsing. And what I've realized in using this is, well, actually the majority of the stuff I do is web browsing and I'm perfectly, you know, contempt, uh, content, not contempt, content using the Chromebook, uh, for most of those things. And it's also light and, you know, uh, like, like the security aspects of it, logging in, have everything import. There's a lot of really good features about it. Uh, but every once in a while you need that extra kind of power. You need that extra capability of a full blown, uh, computer and, that's it's hard to overlook that in the long term. So I mean, if you have it's it's like any specific use technology. If you have the use case for it, then it makes perfect sense for you. Yeah. And and honestly, there was a time you remember netbooks. Yes. There was, there was a time when I had a netbook, <sighs> and if I had oh only boy. waited a little longer, I could have gotten a Chromebook instead of say a netbook, and that would have been way more my speed for what I was using the netbook for. Uh, and then I, right now I just have, I have a, a laptop that's a, uh, you know, it's a, a more powerful laptop. It's technically a low end gaming laptop, but it's portable enough so that that's the one I use whenever I'm traveling. So I don't have a call for, so, like, I don't have a, a, a niche to fill right now. Um, if that laptop were to give up the ghost, I would probably say, well, I've got a, I've got a gaming rig desktop. So I, 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 there's no reason for me to duplicate that with a laptop. I don't do enough gaming for to necessitate that. Right. I would probably look at something like a Chromebook instead because I would want that ability when I'm traveling to check in on all my work stuff, which again, I don't, I don't need anything powerful for that. And all of my, the vast majority of my work is done through browsing. So yep. it would make perfect sense in that case. I just, 
I just happen to have a more powerful computer that does that plus other stuff. So right. there's not a need for me to supplement it. Yeah, I can completely agree with that. This will have 32 gigs of storage, 4 gigs of RAM. Uh, eh, not the best display resolution, 1366 by 768. Uh, not horrible, but uh, not horrible, not amazing, but 12 hours of battery life. You know, it's it's kind of Chromebook area. That's another that's another problem that I have. If if and and I do, uh, if I wanted to replace this Chromebook Pixel at at the point that I feel like I just can't use it anymore, like I'm very used to the fact that this actually has a pretty nice processor inside. That the build quality of it is really up to snuff compared to a lot of Chromebooks that I've seen that just feel, uh, you know, speaking of uh, Tonka. Like feel like a plastic toy, even though Tonka's not mm -hmm. plastic. But you know, it just kind of feels like a toy. It feels hollow, and uh, you know, I I, I I would want that out of my next Chromebook. So, sure. Uh, Fallout is getting the tabletop game treatment. Wasteland Warfare will encompass scenarios from Fallout Three and Fallout Four. Uh, maps apparently will be assembled at random with hex shaped cards. It has an open RPG style progression throughout the game. Cards and tokens that define your character, inventory management, skill improvements, and the ability to group up with other people or go it alone in that desolate wasteland. Fallout Wasteland Warfare should hit by the end of the year. And of course, you've got your show game changers. So you are the perfect person to ask about this. I'm a, I'm a fan of the the mobile game Fallout. I haven't played any of the the big Fallout games. I've played the mobile game and I've actually played it quite a bit. So I'm a Fallout fan of that. Shelter. So I like the I like the series from what I've experienced. What do you think about this? Uh, I am an enormous Fallout war. War never changes. <laughs> Fallout is um, is an amazing series. It's it's a little weird. The the tone of every Fallout game is a little odd because it's a, it's it never quite feels pr balanced. Uh, there's always a lot of very dramatic, dark content there, but there's also a very irreverent, humorous style to it. You've got that yes. very stylized, artistic approach with all, and and the fact that everything is kind of couched in the 40s and 50s, but then set forward after a nuclear apocalypse. It, it has a very interesting art style. It's got a, it's a, a really cool science fiction intellectual property. I love the games. I love board gaming. I love games where you are exploring using a board game approach. And this tile approach where you draw a tile and that represents an area that you are exploring that's used in a lot of different games and i love that game mechanic there's a, a game called uh, betrayal of the house on the hill that uses the same sort of thing where you're exploring a, a spooky house as a group uh, same concept where you draw a tile as you are moving into that space and that reveals what you find there oh that's cool i like that that mechanic works great for something like fallout where you are in a wasteland you have no idea what's around the corner you want to to progress down a certain direction, you draw a tile and that's when you find out, maybe you find there's an old abandoned building or seemingly abandoned building, or maybe it's another vault or it could be an encounter of some sort. Uh, it looks like there's gonna be a lot of room for variations on this game, lots of different sort of quests you can have. They're taking inspiration from some of the strongest uh, uh, elements of the Fallout series. Uh, I loved Fallout 3. I love Fallout New Vegas, and I love Fallout 4. So uh, it's great. The only thing that's really sad is that we're not going to get Veronica Belmont to voice a light switch because she did that <laughs> for Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> how do you so, how do you get Veronica Belmont to voice something on a board game? That's this is what we need to figure out. I, I guess I have to call her, <laughs> and then she, she'll I, yell at me. She'll be and like, I'll, I'll be like it's "Okay, just fine. Like the game. <laughs> You're playing that game again. <sighs> okay, yeah. uh, cool. Well, you know, in retrospect, it actually seems like a perfect fit for tabletop gaming. And like you said earlier, it's really tabletop gaming right now is is undergoing a total renaissance. My kids are starting to get to the age, or at least my oldest is starting to get to the age, where some of these games that I've been hearing about for a while, I think she's right on the cusp of being old enough for me to get them and it not be too overwhelming for her to learn, you know, and for <laughs> for to be patient through kind of the learning process of that. So I'm actually super excited because when I was a kid, man, we played so many board games and I, I just really enjoyed that. It's a lot of fun. And I, I love what we're seeing in the world of table, tabletop games right now. 
Yeah, it's fantastic. I think it's it's almost a reaction to the uh, the fact that so many people moved a lot of their social lives online, mm-hmm. and now this. I think this is kind of a, a a reaction to that. It's almost like not not a rejection, but a move back to say. I want to spend some actual time in close proximity with my friends and have yeah. real face-to-face uh, conversations and and have fun with them because there's something really bonding about that group experience. And uh, I mean, I've been watching this among my friends for a while. Like, there's just been this growing passion around getting together to do activities, mostly board games and card games. And if you look at something like Kickstarter. You know, the the game uh, category of Kickstarter has outperformed every other category when it comes to fundraising. If you look at the total number of dollars raised on Kickstarter, games is higher than any other category. So it shows that people are really passionate about this stuff. And uh, yeah, and and the fact that I love Fallout just means that I'm going to be buying this board game day one. No, no question about it. Awesome. And I'm sure it'll be on your show at that point as well. Yes. <laughs> Then I can count it off on my taxes. Yeah, there you go. See, that's that's how you do it, folks. Up next, uh, we have a few emails. we got a bunch of emails. We're going to read and discuss some of those. But first, let's take a minute to thank Eero. They're the sponsor of this episode. This is an Eero right here. With Eero, you can install an enterprise-grade Wi-Fi system in your home in just a few minutes. It's actually very easy. You simply download the Eero app on your iOS or Android device, and it's going to walk you through each step of the process. It's quick. It's easy. It's painless. Uh, you create and share a guest network if you like. You can know how many devices are connected at any point. You can check the internet speed that you're getting from your service provider all through the app. Eero is protected with state-of-the-art WPA2 encryption and uh, updates automatically. So you're always going to have the latest features and security at all times. Uh, and they are Eero is excited to announce that there's the second generation Eero and Eero Beacon. This is the setup that I set up in my home. I got the regular hub the, the regular system and then the two beacons that plug into any power outlet that you have throughout your home to extend Wi-Fi through those. Uh, Eero Home Wi-Fi system started in early 2016, and since then they've, been, they've learned from hundreds of thousands of systems, making them smarter, faster, and more reliable. The new Eero second generation and Eero beacon allow a customer to build a Wi-Fi system that's more perfectly tailored to their home than ever before. And the unique layout, it's all part of the process when you're going through the app. They offer more speed and range and the same high quality, elegant design that people have come to expect. With the addition of a third 5 gigahertz radio, the second generation Eero is now tri-band and twice as fast as its predecessor, which lets customers do more simultaneously in every room of their home. And with the addition of a new thread radio, Eero can connect to low power devices such as locks, doorbells, other sensors, and more. Expanding your coverage in any room is super easy. Like I said, with the Eero Beacon, you simply plug it into a wall and you're covered. That's it. And it actually has a little nightlight that's optional to turn it on or, you know, sense when it's dark in the room. You set it up so that you put it on an outlet that needs a nightlight. It's like it's doing double duty. It's awesome. You can add as many Eero Beacons as you want throughout your home. If there's an outlet there's a Wi-Fi spot. And like I said, it's just really easy to set up and super effective. Uh, so for free overnight shipping, if you want to check this out for yourself, you can. You can get free overnight shipping if you visit Eero.com. And at checkout, select overnight shipping and then enter TNT. And that's actually going to make your overnight shipping free. So you can get it right away. That's Eero.com. Make sure and enter code TNT while you're there. It also lets them know that you heard about it through Tech News Today, and we thank Eero for their support. So as you might expect, we got a good amount of feedback regarding our discussion yesterday on the Google Diversity Manifesto. Uh, You have stuff that you want to say, so we thought we'd have this section be all about your voice and your thoughts on the topic. Uh, Got some really great emails, so we're going to start off here with Dan S., who said that Megan and I, like others, actually misconstrued why the employee was fired. Dan writes... He wasn't fired for what what he said, but rather for how he said it. Had he written it as a blog post on his personal blog, he would he would still have a job. Had he written it in response to his management chain uh, chain asking what are the issues, he would still have a job. 
Had he sent it out to a few coworkers, he would still have a job. He didn't do any of those things. He sent it to a company-wide distribution list in violation of company policy, he says. Uh, he caused discussions on the topics, which are in and of themselves good, but in a disruptive manner. He made the CEO end his vacation early to come back and deal with this. All these things cost the company quite literally millions of dollars. That's why he lost his job. He was not fired for the content, but for the violation of company policy and the disruption he caused. Had he sent out a memorandum of a political nature that the company and managers agreed with, but caused this level of disruption, uh, he goes on to say he would have lost his job. And point, uh, point being, obviously, the disruption and cost to the company caused by the manifesto was enough to let him go. I definitely feel like parts of this are true. What are your thoughts on this, Jonathan? Uh, I think... Like you say, I think parts of it are true. It's this is a very difficult situation to talk about, largely because it, this is what happened. But anything else is a hypothetical, right? right? So mm -hmm. hypothetically, let's say he wrote a blog post as opposed to sent it out on this distribution list. Would he have been fired? We can't say that no, he wouldn't be fired because we don't know. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm always cautious about going down the road of if this had happened a different way, things would have not turned out the way they did. Right. Uh, it's that's impossible for us to say. We can only we can only really comment on what actually did happen. Uh, I think you know that we're in such a uh, an era of of heightened awareness about these issues. Whether you are someone who is in support of uh, diversity uh, strategies, so that you're bringing more people in. I personally am one of those people. I feel like diverse backgrounds and points of view end up making things stronger in the long run. And if you don't seek it out, you lose out on that added value. You, I can't even imagine where our world would be right now if we had earlier inspired more people of very, you know, more people other than white guys, essentially, is what it boils down to. You and I, to, you and I. To, <laughs> right, to get into to get into to get into these fields. I mean, yeah. I look at some of the most influential people in the world of technology who were exceptional for multiple reasons. Like the very first computer programmer, you could argue, was Ada Lovelace, who mm. created computer programs before there were computers. And to think how many Ada Lovelaces have been discouraged from being in this world because of the thoughts that are similar to the ones voiced in that that uh, that mail that went out to everybody. And to me, that's tragic for all of us. So I also come from this from a biased point of view, right? I, I have the bias of feeling like the letting the employee go was the right decision for multiple reasons, largely because if you don't do that, what message are you sending to the people who belong to those vulnerable populations who work for you? Um, but yeah, this is a really complicated issue. I mean, I, I, I get the objections from the other side. I don't agree with them necessarily, but I do understand where they're coming from. I think that this... Uh, does lead to the potential for more deep conversations on the topic, which ultimately I think will be beneficial. In the short term, they're going to be incredibly difficult. But I hope in the long term, they end up helping everyone. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. No matter what, something, a situation such as this forces the conversation, which to a certain degree, it was one of the author's stated goals is to have have this, you know, these perspectives discussed out in the open. It just turns out that, you know, I mean, according to Sundar Pichai, this was a violation of Google's code of conduct, how it was done. Uh, Sundar had said to suggest a group of our colleagues have traits that make them less biologically suited to that work is offensive and not okay. It's contrary to our basic values and our code of conduct, which expects each Googler to do their utmost to create a workplace culture that is free of harassment, intimidation, bias, and unlawful discrimination. And to that, uh, to that point seems to me like it wasn't merely just the channel through which it was delivered. It was, you know, the, the actual content that led to uh, Pichai and, you know, Google Board's decision 
to let the employee go. So I'm not even so sure that if it was posted on his personal blog, it wouldn't make a difference if it from there made its way to the, you know, through the certain channels to be put in front of the same people the way this did. You know, it might sure. be the same situation. And, I mean, it may have been that perhaps if it had gone through a different route, it would have been a disciplinary action or right. some sort of other like not confrontation, but a conversation might have happened that would not have necessarily ended with someone losing their job. But again, that's a hypothetical and we cannot really be sure one way or the other without that having had happened <laughs> instead of what did happen. Right. So, right. Right. Um, well, so we have a few more emails here. Ke uh, Kevin M. wrote in regarding my assertion yesterday that anyone who disagreed had had the choice to stop using Google products. Uh, Kevin makes a very valid point here. He said, don't use Google as the solution if you disagree with Google's decision to fire the employee is seriously flawed. Jason, how does one not use Google uh, today's world in today's world when their main business is advertising and it is spread throughout any part of the web that we rely on. I, I think that's a very valid point, right? Like it's, it's one thing to say, we'll stop using Google products, but Google is a company that creates, yes, many products, but some of those products are next to impossible to avoid. Like how do you avoid Google's ads when you visit random sites throughout the web? Is there any way to do that? Like, a, <laughs> I don't know. You, you, you stop using the web? <laughs> Maybe I mean, that's, that's it, not right? that's not really that's not really a legitimate option. I mean, I I believe strongly in the the idea that uh, the internet is very much a utility, and the web being one one facet of the internet is increasingly important to people to the point where you can't really seriously suggest to someone, oh, just stop using the web. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. You not using Google is like truly like going cold turkey no google <laughs> no no google products at all yeah is is so difficult because you can't even really be certain how many of the things you rely upon are powered by google even if it's not overtly google exactly. right yeah it could yep. be a business that is using google's you know hosting services in which case you're inadvertently supporting it it is uh if nothing else it really points to how incredible incredibly ingrained Google is into everything now. Yep. It absolutely does. Now, um, uh, we, we do have a final email. Shiloh T actually touches on Kevin's point uh, specifically. Shiloh seems to feel like this isn't that complicated. Shiloh writes, <laughs> not using Google is not so hard. Many years ago during Google's pre-Android days, I decided not to use any of Google's products or services. At the time, it was a strong moral crusade of mine. Back then, it was kind of hard. Hotmail kind of sucked at spam blocking. Meanwhile, Gmail was all the rage. Nowadays, that moral crusade is a bit more of habit. I had to come to terms with Microsoft and their privacy and moral issues and was looking at Google Google as the new great, great evil of our time. In a few years, something else will come along that will make us wistfully pine for Google's issues. I know I can't completely avoid Google, as a lot of sites have content that comes from Google, ad services, and some sites use Google to handle on-site searching, and many services use Google's backend, like Pokemon Go. So I get that, but I don't use Android phones or the Chrome browser and don't have a Google account. Uh, he says, now I do use YouTube, but I try to find content elsewhere, such as Vimeo, or buy the content directly from the producer. The way the tech world is now, if Google does something really cool, Microsoft, Amazon, or Apple will likely have their own flavor out soonish. Oftentimes, they are good enough, but sometimes they're better, and I'm fine with that. I don't know if this necessarily argues the opposite side. I think it kind of illustrates actually exactly what we were talking about. You can get rid of a lot of services, search, browser, video maps, smartphones, email docs, social networks, etc., but you, it's really hard to get rid of it all. It's really hard yeah. to step away from everything that's next to impossible. I mean, if you're not directly using Google services, you're most likely indirectly using them. It's If you trace it all back, it does become a point where you eventually have to ask yourself the question, at what point will I be okay with this? Because to completely eschew myself of all of Google's involvement with everything makes it very difficult to get anything meaningful done in certain realms, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't be able to do work if I had really put my foot down and said, I cannot use Google. Well, my company would tell me, you've got to answer your email. Stop ignoring it. 
and uh, we use Google for our emails. So I would have to. Um, That's a really good point, right? Through your, you might not necessarily have much of a choice. Your work might rely upon it. Yeah, I mean, there's, and again, this does again raise that that specter, that idea of, you know, back in the day. First of all, I think it's interesting that he swore off Google pre-Android days, you know, because Google's motto has always been, don't be evil. And I like to think that pre-Android, that was a lot more transparent <laughs> than, yeah. than what, than say today. I, not that Android was the cause of it, but rather just as that as a, a divider for chronology sake. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I, I, today, I just don't know how you would do it without putting yourself to unnecessary hardship and, while I often scoff at people who talk about the whole uh, antitrust approach with Google, when you really, really put serious thought to it, you might think this there might be some legitimacy to this. There might be a need to spin off some companies at some point and and have this operate un, as totally separate entities because it's the domination of so many different aspects, particularly of the web, is – getting harder and harder to deny. Yeah, absolutely. I should point out that October 2015 was the time at which uh, Alphabet dropped Don't Be Evil from their code of conduct. So, you know, that's, that's not true. even part of the equation anymore. Yeah. So really, it's like it, evil it on. Did, they just did a strike through of the word don't. <laughs> Be evil. And then scribbled in sometimes. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, anyways, great emails. Really appreciate everybody's thoughtful comments on the topic. Uh, if you want to share your thoughts, TNT at twit.tv. Always look forward to receiving those and hopefully reading them on the show. Coming up, improved advice on how best to create a secure password. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker. They're the sponsor of this episode. There's a, a ritual that I'm sure you are aware of at this point. When you're looking for your keys, you look everywhere, right? You look at the couch, the kitchen, your pockets, of course. Uh, then the strange places uh, that is probably not there, but you're going to check anyways. Bathroom, fridge, hamper, wherever, under, <laughs> underneath the pillow. Then you start getting creative behind the refrigerator, uh, inside the dish in the top shelf of your, of your kitchen, whatever. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device and now they've done it again with the all-new tracker pixel it's actually very tiny i have it here in my hands uh with the tracker pixel you'll never worry about losing your things again because you can put this little sucker on pretty much anything tracker pixel is the lightest bluetooth tracking device on the market you place tracker pixel on whatever you tend to lose keys wallets even your cat it's small enough to fit on your smallest items when you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached uh, you can use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. It even has powerful LED lights so you can find your items in the dark. And if you happen to lose your phone, it works in the other direction. You just press the button on the tracker pixel that you have and it will cue your phone to ring even if it was left on silent so you can find it. You can even locate your item if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. And Tracker's 30 day money back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. You should check it out for yourself. Go to thetracker.com and enter promo code TNT. You'll save 20% off any order by doing that. That's T H E T R A C K R.com. Promo code TNT for 20% off. And we thank Tracker for their support of Tech News Today. TNT's fan of the day is Colin Seeley on Twitter, who sent us this picture saying, I'm working a summer job at a golf course, and I always listen to TNT while out picking the range. So that's that's going going around with that vehicle. Apparently, it's called picking the range, where you go around with the vehicle and you swoop up all the golf balls. I uh, always thought that would be an interesting job. Like, how, ma how many golfers are, like, aiming at you when you're doing that? All of them. The answer is all of them. <laughs> because for for one for one glorious moment, you're sh you're shooting the golf ball at a moving target. That just never mm -hmm. happens. Usually, mm -hmm. still, I'm actually going to go golfing for the first time in many years. I am not a golfer, uh, but I'm going to go golfing. I think at the end of the month, and uh, I'm scared. Yeah, I live near a golf course, and that's as good as that's as close as I. I as a left hander, just keep me away from golf. <laughs> it's just. It's just a comedy of errors if I get on the golf course. I, I, I like watching from afar and and admiring the patience and skill and not 
worrying about the fact that I'd be digging up an entire course with a golf club or if get, I were out there. Or getting hit in the head with a golf ball. I once went out with my friends and I was standing by the cart and I didn't know that my friend was hitting. And mind you, I was not in front of him. I was off to the side, but he had a bad hit. And suddenly I hear four and I look over and I see a golf ball go like this. And I'm I'm not joking. It hit the, the cart right next to my head right about here. Just flap right off it. Yikes. So I came this close to dying that day on the golf course. Or at least having a massive goose egg. Oh, man, that would have hurt so bad. Uh, anyways, we respect all you do for the golfers of, of the world. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You can post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we're going to find it. Now, finally, uh, thanks to Bob Somamine. Somamine, I think I'm saying your last name correctly, on Twitter for sending in this link. Back in 2003, Bill Burr put out a guide for creating secure passwords that ultimately went on to inform password requirements on all kinds of sites, email, banking, you name it. The idea there being that a shortish password or you know medium length password filled with random upper and lowercase characters, numbers, and symbols was sufficient for keeping the bad guys out of your accounts. It turns out it doesn't matter as much which characters are added into the password. If it's short, it's ultimately easier for a computer to guess, particularly when you compare it to a long password, even one comprised of, say, four dictionary words. Usually they, they had told you don't pick dictionary words because those are easy to guess. Bill Burr told the Wall Street Journal that he regrets that advice. He got this information back then from a white paper that had been written in the 80s before the Internet uh, was, you know, was what it is today. Uh, but now they're basically saying you, you make passwords that are long uh, and possibly filled with words that you know. There was an XKCD uh, comic that illustrated this. It used the four-word passphrase, correct horse battery staple. If you can remember that phrase, that would take a computer 550 years to guess. Yeah, so, but don't use that password because they already did for XKCD. Yeah, and, yeah don't do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pick four would, random words of your own and make right. that your password. For example, I use major, 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 a character from Catch-22, and uh, that is not a safe password. As and you're out. not going to use that anymore. You just said it no. out loud. Well, I use password12345 yeah. on all of my important accounts. Jason, can I just tell you how to this day when I see news reports about passwords being stolen and I see how many people – Use either password or one two three four five, or if they're really clever, five four three two one. Oh, uh, that you know, threw them I, off. <laughs> I still can't believe it. I cannot believe it, and and I'm not expecting everyone to have crazy strong passwords that are 16 characters long and have absolutely no resemblance to any kind of word or you know any sort of mnemonic device that you could use to remember it. It's literally just random garbage to any casual glance. But but people, come on, just just don't use the the most common ones that that are out there because no one even has to guess. You don't even have to tell a computer to try it. You could just you know what? Before I even set the the massive array of processors I have back here, let me just try and type in admin and oh look, we're in. Hey, yeah, Yay. it's that easy, and it's probably that easy. Well, it is obviously according to those lists. It's that easy for a heck of a lot of accounts. And yes. yeah, it's kind of crazy, but you know, the uh, lowest point, I mean, the, the, the least amount of resistance, I suppose someone's setting up an account. I know back in the day I did that, right? Like maybe not, maybe not password is my password, but it was like, eh, I just want in the account. I don't care. Something yeah. I'm going to remember tomorrow. And you know, maybe it was a throwaway account that I didn't really care that much about, but maybe it was a, an account I cared a lot about and I just didn't know any better. It was just, I mean, I, you want me to I, pick a password? I, sure. Whatever. Here. I was definitely with one of those guys who for a very long time in the early days of the internet was using the exact same password everywhere. Yep. And, you know, that was, it was convenient for me because I only had to remember the one, but then, you know, you realize like if one gets compromised, then everything is compromised. So yeah. I, I practice much better, uh, much better security behaviors now than I did back then. But uh, yeah, I, I'm still amazed to see uh, these the you know, folks using next to no protection whatsoever. And I, I love the XKCD example because it really does show that it doesn't take a crazy amount of different 
uh, letters and symbols and stuff that have no resemblance to a word to make it difficult for a computer to guess. And honestly, that's the best kind of password for you. It's It reminds me of CAPTCHAs, which were designed to be easy for humans to complete, but hard for machines to complete. That's what we want as a solution. You don't want to make it hard for the human because then you just have a, a disincentive to actually use whatever that service is. So it, I'm glad that that comic is getting circulated again. I thought it was great the first time I saw it when it was originally published. And I'm also just a huge XKCD fan. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty awesome comic. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean the greater, the greater problem of course, is that everybody who's on the internet has a million and one accounts and, you know, the, the rule is don't reuse passwords. So no matter whether you're using a password that's four long words that are easier to remember than a bunch of characters, it's still next to impossible to remember all the different passwords you have for all the different services. And that's where uh, I believe a password manager comes in to help you manage that stuff. So uh, agreed. I use LastPass and I love it, but there are a lot of them out there. And, uh, you know, it's better than not and it's better than reusing your passwords. So think about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, this is a lot of fun. I'm so happy we got the chance to do a podcast together again. It's been too long. Um, you do a lot these days. Tell us about it all. I am the host of the show <laughs> Tech Stuff, where we tackle all things technological. Those uh, publish twice a week and uh, comes out Wednesdays and Fridays. I'm also live streaming those. So if you ever want to see what it's like for me to record an episode, uh, uh, typically on Wednesdays and Fridays I record, and that's over at twitch.tv slash tech stuff if you want to check that out. But definitely check out the podcasts. We cover everything from how like a refrigerator works to we do deep dives on important people in technology. Uh, like uh, I did one on Ada Lovelace as an example, or we'll cover a profile for a company. I did a, I did one on Samsung and I learned an awful lot about the politics of South Korea, which are fascinating. Uh, then I also do game changers where we talk about games. So that's every Wednesday, 1 PM Eastern over on how stuff works, Facebook page. You can actually go there and see the old episodes as well. They're all available. And, uh, then I've got Forward Thinking, my video series about the future and how could we make the future awesome. And trust me, <laughs> uh, I I work really hard to make sure that the shows are optimistic but not unrealistic. So I am of the belief that you have to acknowledge the challenges that are in your way and still work to overcome them and you can still be an optimist. So check out that show too. Right on, man. That's awesome. Uh, the future is in is in need of some uh, some some help. optimism. Optimism. Yeah. So yeah, uh, appreciate all you do, and thanks again, man. This was a lot of fun. Thank Be you. Best of luck with everything, and we will talk to you soon, Jonathan. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, and find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. You can always find all the ways to subscribe to this show by visiting our show page. That's twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm easy to find. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to our technical director today, Brian Burnett. Thank you, sir. Thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio. Got some occasional Burke chats. I'm sorry we didn't show any, but uh, he was he was busy today. <laughs> thanks to Kevin for editing the show, and thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, Jonathan, this is the point where you high-five me because it's easier for you to do it than... There we go. <laughs> uh, okay, that worked.